What is your favorite season? If you ask any one of my siblings, hands down, we would say that one of our favorite seasons was Advent. Why? Because of Advent's time. Advent's time was where we would get together every night of Advent. Absolutely no exceptions. Once darkness had fallen, we would sit together in the living room. Someone would have prepared a little treat plate, usually with a little Christmas orange or something. We would light our Advent's candle. We would sing Advent songs. Come Lord Jesus, never got old. <laughs> Through the four weeks, we would have a prayer time intentions. And then we would read a story from our book filled with wonderful little tales like the cobbler's sons. Our favorite story was read on Christmas Eve. It's called The Christmas Apple and I want to read it for you. by Ruth Sawyer. Once upon a time, there lived in the Tyrol a little clockmaker by the name of Herman Yosef. He lived in one little room with a bench for his work and a chest for his wood and his tools and a cupboard for dishes and a trundle bed under the bench. Besides these, there was a stool and that was all, excepting the clocks. There were hundreds of clocks, little and big, carved and plain, some with wooden faces and some with porcel porcelain ones, shelf clocks, cuckoo clocks, clocks with chimes and clocks without and they all hung on the walls, covering them quite up. In front of his one little window, there was a little shelf, and on this Herman put all his best clocks to show the passers-by. Often they would stop and look, and someone would cry, See! Herman Yosef has made a new clock. It is finer than any of the rest. Then, if it happened that anybody was wanting a clock, he would come in and buy it. Now, I said Herman was a little clockmaker. That was because his back was bent and his legs were crooked, which made him very short and funny to look at. But there was no kinder face than his in all the city, and the children loved him. Whenever a toy was broken or a doll had lost an arm or a leg or an eye, its careless child would carry it straight to Herman's little shop. The poor doll needs mending, she would say. Canst thou do it for me? And whatever work Herman was doing, he would put aside to mend the broken toy or doll. And never a finig would he take for the mending. Go spend it for sweetmeats, or better still, put it till Christmas time. Twill get thee some happiness then, maybe, he would say. Now it was the custom in that long ago for those who lived in the city to bring gifts to the great cathedral on Christmas and lay them before the Holy Mother and Child. People saved all through the year that they might have something wonderful to bring on that day. And there was a saying among them that when a gift was brought that pleased the Christ child more than any other, he would reach down for Mary's arms and take it. This was but a saying, of course. The old Herr Graf, the oldest man in the city, could not remember that it had ever really happened. And many there were who laughed at the very idea. But children often talked about it. And the poets made beautiful verses about it. And often when a rich gift was placed beside the altar, the watchers would whisper among themselves, perhaps now we shall see the miracle. And those who had no gifts to bring went to the cathedral just the same to celebrate the birth of Christ. The little clockmaker was one of these. Often he would stop and would be stopped and someone would ask, how happens it that you never bring a gift? Once the bishop himself questioned him, poor than thou has brought offerings to the child, where is thy gift? Then it was that Herman had answered, wait, someday you shall see, I too shall bring a gift. The truth of it was that the little clockmaker was so busy giving away all the year that there was never anything left at Christmas time. But he had a wonderful idea on which he had been working every minute that he could spare time from his clocks. It had taken him years and years. No one knew anything about it but Trudy, his neighbor's child, and Trudy had grown from a baby into a little house mother. And still the gift was not finished. It was to be a clock, the most wonderful and beautiful clock ever made. And every part of it had been fashioned with loving care. The case, the works, the weights, the hands and the face, all had taken years of labor. He had spent years carving the case and hands, years perfecting the works. And now Herman saw that with a little more haste and time, he could finish it for the coming Christmas. He mended the children's toys as before, but he gave up making his regular clocks. So there were fewer to sell, and often his cupboard was empty, and he went supperless to bed. But that only made him a little thinner, and his face a little kinder. And meantime, the gift clock became more and more beautiful. It was fashioned after a rude stable with rafters, stall, and crib. 
The Holy Mother knelt beside the manger in which the tiny Christ child lay, while through the open door the hour came. The hours came. Three were kings, three were shepherds, and three were soldiers, and three were angels. And when the hours struck, the figures knelt in adoration before the sleeping child, while the silver chimes played the Magnificat. Thou seest, said the clockmaker to Trudy, it is not just on Sundays and holidays that we should remember to worship the Christ child and bring him gifts, but every day, every hour. The days went by like clouds before winter's wind, and the clock was finished at last. So happy was Herman with his work that he put the gift clock clock on the shelf before the little window to show passers-by. There were crowds looking at it all day long, and many would whisper, Do you think this can be the gift Herman has spoken of, his offering on Christmas Eve to the church? The day before Christmas came, Herman cleaned up his little shop, wound all his clocks, brushed his clothes, and then went over the gift clock again to be sure everything was perfect. It will not look meanly beside the other gifts, he thought happily. In fact, he was so happy that he gave away all but one fennig to the blind beggar who passed his door. And then, remembering that he had eaten nothing since breakfast, he spent that last fennig for a Christmas apple to eat with the crust of bread he had. These he was putting by in the cupboard to eat after he was dressed, when the door opened and Trudy was standing there crying softly. Child, child, what ails thee? And he gathered her in his arms. Tis the father. He is hurt, and all the money that was put by for the tree and sweets and toys has gone to hair doctor. And now, how can I tell the children? Already they've lighted the candle at the window and are waiting for Kris Kringle to come. The clockmaker laughed merrily. Come, come, little one, all will be well. Herman will sell a clock for thee. Some house in the city must need a clock, and in a wink you shall, we shall have money enough for the tree and the toys. Go home and sing. He buttoned on his great coat, and picking out the best of the old clocks, he went out. He went first to the rich merchants, but their houses were full of clocks. Then to the journeymen, but they said his clock was old-fashioned. He even stood in the corner of the streets in the square, crying, A clock! A good clock for sale! But no one paid any attention to him. At last he went to the hairgraph himself. Will your excellency excellency buy a clock? He said, trembling at his old boldness, his own boldness. I would not ask, but it is Christmas and I'm needing to buy happiness for some children. The hair graph smiled. Yes, I will buy a clock, but not that one. I will pay a thousand golden for the clock thou hast had in thy window these four days past. But your excellency, that is impossible. And poor Herman trembled harder than ever. Poof, nothing is impossible. That clock or none, get thee home and I will send for it in half an hour and pay thee thy golden. The little clockmaker stumbled out. Anything but that, anything but that. He kept mumbling over and over to himself on his way home. But as he passed the neighbor's house, he saw the children at the window with their lighted candle and he heard Trudy singing. And so it happened that the servant who came from the hair graph carried the gift clock away with him. But the clockmaker would take but five of the thousand golden in payment. And as the servant disappeared up the streets, the chimes commenced to ring the great cathedral. Then the streets suddenly became noisy with the many people going thither, bearing their Christmas offerings. I have gone empty-handed before, said the little clockmaker sadly. I can go empty-handed once again. And again he buttoned up his great coat. As he turned to shut his cupboard door behind him, his eyes fell on the Christmas apple, and an odd little smile crept into the corners of his mouth and lighted his eyes. It is all I have, my dinner for two days. I will carry that to the Christ child. It is better after all than going empty-handed. How full of peace and beauty was the great cathedral when Herman entered it. There were thousands of tapers burning everywhere, and the sweet scent of the Christmas greens and the laden altar before the holy mother and child. There were richer gifts than had been brought for many years, marvelously wrought vessels from the greatest silversmiths, cloths of gold and cloths of silk brought from the east by the merchants. Poets had brought their own songs illuminated on rolls of heavy parchment. Painters had brought their pictures of saints and the holy family. Even the king himself had brought his crown and scepter to lay before the child. And after all these offerings came the little clockmaker, walking slowly down the long, dim aisle, holding tight to his Christmas apple. The people saw him and a murmur rose. 
hummed a moment indistinctly through the church and then grew clear and articulate. Shame. Shame. See, he is too mean to bring his clock. He hoards it as a miser hoards his gold. See what he brings. Shame. The words reached Herman and he stumbled on blindly. His head dropped forward on his breast, his hands groping the way. The distance seemed interminable. Now he knew he was past the seats. Now his feet touched the first step and there were seven to climb up towards the altar. Would his feet never reach the top? One, two, three, he counted slowly to himself, then tripped and almost fell. Four, five, six, he was nearly there. There was but one more. The murmur of shame died away and in its place rose one of wonder and awe. Soon the words became intelligible. The miracle, it's the miracle. The people knelt in the big cathedral. The bishop raised his hands in prayer and the little clockmaker stumbled to the last step, looked up through dim eyes and saw the child leaning toward him far down from Mary's arms with hands outstretched to take the gift. There truly is a, a Hermann Josef, a saint. He was canonized in 1958. He was lived in about the 1200s. His story is a little bit different than this, but it does involve our Blessed Mother and an apple that he offered to her. So I pray that you, as you worship the Christ child, every day, every hour, in kindness, in simplicity, that you experience him reaching out, embracing you uh, this Christmas as you give him your heart, as you give him everything you have. And that's all he wants. And God bless you.